presentation is about the common slash cortical communication protocol. Um, it doesn't sound like much, but it's kind of the glue within the Monty system. Um, it will be relatively short to go through, but um, so what actually is it? Uh, I don't know who is there, but if you were, if you remember November 2021, we had this meeting and Jeff wrote on this whiteboard. Um, and we were talking about the uh, code. Yeah, oh, it's gosh. yours. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I went back into the meeting recordings. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were talking about the cortical communication protocol, or also the AI bus. Um, Which everyone hated, so we didn't use that. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, kind of talking about um, how we might. Uh, build out an AI bus, which is kind of a common protocol of how the comp components in Monty communicate with each other. So how learning modules communicate, how sensor modules communicate, and so on. And it was kind of talked about as like AI bus as a platform, when the vendors sell sensor modules, robotic modules, uh, and so on. Um, and yeah, in the same meeting, there was also put up like a product roadmap with uh, potentially looking into reference frames and TBT next, and then also options for what to do next um, at AI bus research listed down here. And I kind of just drew two circles around this, which turned, as I would say, into the Monty project now. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is, uh, of course, also the mega project came, uh, was listed here as well. But anyways, the idea, um, of this common communication protocol was pretty much at the beginning of Monty. And it's still there, even though we don't talk about it that often. Um, so what, where do we actually need this protocol? So Monty, just as a refresher, has um, three major components. We have sensor modules, we have learning modules, and we have uh, motor systems. And then we have communication within Monty which includes a sensor module to learning module, learning module to learning module hierarchically, and learning module to learning module uh, through lateral voting. Um, one note on the hierarchical communication, it can also go top down. So uh, from the top to the lower level learning module. Um, and then finally, learning module to uh, motor system. And then we have communication between Monty and the world, which includes world to sensor module and motor system to world. And basically, we want that all of the communication within Monty uses a common communication protocol, a common format of what is always communicated. And basically, um, these two are the interface between Monty and the real world. So the main job of the sensor module is to convert raw data into the common communication protocol. And then the motor system converts um, the CCP into uh, motor commands like muscle movements or moving actuators in the real world. Um, okay, why do we need the CCP? Um, this is a nice figure that Jeff made, I think. Um, and it nicely illustrates, I think, of how we want Monty to be a really flexible system where we can just plug and play these individual components as we want. We want to be able to have as many learning modules uh, from potentially different modalities interacting with each other. We want to be able to stack them on top of each other um, to have like a deeper hierarchy. We want to have the possibility for parallelism and that's really only possible if they all have a very similar or all have the same interface and we can yeah easily combine them into arbitrary architectures depending on the problem okay how do we define the ccp so this is how it is uh, in, implemented in the code um, we'll go into a bit more abstract as well so basically all Monty components expect instances of the state class as input and are expected to expected to output them. That kind of enforces 
uh, all the messages passed within Monty to contain um, certain attributes or information. Um, state always has the same attributes and is just interpreted differently in different contexts. So what does that mean? For example, a state output from the sensor module is interpreted as an observed state. The learning module output is a hypothesized state. So which object do I think I'm on right now? And what do you think is the pose of it? Uh, learning module votes, so lateral outputs are all possible states. Uh, so list of state instances. And then finally, the motor output is a target state. And just in code, so you can see it, for example, here, hypothesized state would be the output of the learning module. Your observed state, this would be the output of the sensor module. This would be your vote. And they all kind of have the same attributes. Um, so what are these attributes? So each state communicates a location and orientation, which is the pose in a common reference frame, for example, relative to the body and features at this pose. And features uh, are optional and it can have as many features as it wants and uh, features can also be modality specific. And then on the side, uh, some additional information that we use for information routing and weighing is a confidence value. So how confident am I in this? location and orientation and the features that are detected, a sender ID, um, sender type, which is learning module or sensor module, because they are treated differently in some cases, and whether to use this state, which is just a Boolean. Um, almost last slide, what are the attributes of state in detail in the code? Yeah. So. At the moment, uh, location is explicitly expressed as x, y, z coordinates relative to the body. Then we have morphological features, which is a dictionary. It must contain pose vectors, which are three orthonormal unit vectors. They encode the orientation. So together, those two represent the pose. And we have pose fully defined, which just tells us kind of how much, like, does the is the orientation fully defined? Do we have some symmetries, for example? Um, and then non-morphological features, again, as a dictionary, it's optional, uh, variable length and type can be modality specific. Um, these features don't change when the object pose changes. So for example, color or curvature or temperature or something like that. And then confidence is between zero and one. Uh, Use state is just a Boolean flag. Sender ID is a unique string for each of the building blocks of Monty. And then sender type is either sensor module or learning module. Um, that's so here, for, in the, um, there's no information as to whether it's visual or auditory or tactile. It's just completely independent of that, right? Yes. So the non-morphological features might be like features that can only be detected by vision, like color. But um, yeah, you it's always the same format and always the same attribute types, uh, independent of modality. But even the features, it seems like, you know, to the receiver, you don't, they don't really care. It just yeah. might be color, but they don't, I mean, at least in the brain, yeah. it's just patterns, you don't know. Exactly, yeah, it doesn't matter what it actually represents. We were talking about that this morning, and it's one of the, it's one of the most amazing things about brains is that the neurons are really, you know, they don't know anything. They don't know what yeah. they're looking at. They don't know what the data represents. They, they're just cells, and um, the, the system has to work completely with nothing knowing anything about the nature of the data. <laughs> but it's a fact for brains, so. Um, I mean, each neuron yeah. just has its dendrites and connections and learning. Right. Thing and, right. It's, you know, it's, it, 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 it sounds simple, but the depth of that, I mean, making a system work this way and understanding is actually very challenging. I still struggle with it myself. Yeah, and we've been kind of, so for the past, yeah, since November 2021, we've kind of been implementing all the Monty components to kind of figure out what actually 
do we need to communicate between them and to fine tune this information? I mean, it was pretty clear from the beginning that we want to communicate features uh, and poses, but just whether this all works and we can, and that we can actually use this format for all, all the different types of communication within Monty uh, really came together nicely in the past months, I think. This is really nice. Um, I didn't know you were doing all this stuff. Um, yeah, I can go through the last slide just with what we can do now. So, and then, but, but yeah, go ahead if you want to do something, say something first. No, no worries. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, given this uh, nice protocol that we have, we can now flexibly combine Monty components and generate arbitrarily large and complex architectures. Um, we can use the inputs to learning modules to model sensory motor input using reference frames, which is not directly like that much related to the CCP, but we needed to make sure that we have all the information um, in the CCP to be able to to do this and yeah basically we can given the features and poses we can perform fast learning of structured models and fast and robust inference on object id and pose based on arbitrary movement over the object uh, we can vote between models of different modalities we can combine multi-sensory models of object components into compositional objects and scenes that's kind of the hierarchy work we've been doing lately. And use learned models to guide movement and interact with the world efficiently. That's kind of the work that Niels has been doing. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> wow. Uh, any I didn't, know, I didn't know what was going on. Maybe maybe worked on this in context of the patents or something what they just got today. So uh, it brings they things. implemented this a while ago. I mean they have to, well, to show all the presenting it basically like this and simply is really quite amazing to me at least. Um I think I think this exposes something. One way to think about money and with the brain is that we always think about AI systems or or vision systems or whatever it is processing visual data or processing auditory data or processing factual data. But I think what's exposed here and one of the strange lessons of thousand brain theory is that the brain is really a processor of space. That's what it is. It processes space. The data type is space and pose and orientation. And the vast majority of what's going on in your brain is processing reference frames and spaces and distances. And um, it's just a and then sort of the what we typically think of, you know, our sensory input is sort of, sort of, it's not obviously it's important, but it's sort of like it's the it's a feeder into the space processor, <laughs> you know. And it's like, oh yeah, we're going to use this stuff to figure out what's going on in all these the positions of things in the world and, and how you know where everything is in relationship and how things move. Um, it's just a, it's it's really a very different way from traditionally thinking about both computing and AI. Um, and um, I think it's, it's really cool. It's kind of interesting to think about transformers because they, you know, with language, it's just one D. Right. But they had to put in a notion of position no. overlaid on the feature to get it to work. <laughs> and then the more recent stuff is, I think it's a cyclical location. Mm -hmm. It's not a absolute location. I'm going back to what Vivian presented. Um, I mean, the nice thing about what you presented is that we're sort of taking, a, you're sort of laying a foundation for the whole idea is you're laying a foundation for which you can build these other models, build the sensory model, model. It is a backbone for how communications works. And um, and starting on that premise as opposed to slowly discovering it through various you know AI projects and so on. Um, to take a much more fundamental approach to the whole problem, which I think is, uh, is something unique to them, and it's really cool that we can. Yeah, I think that 3D position orientation is something that could be elaborated over time. I mean, it serves exploring sensory motor space, you know, but I, I'm feeling that it could generalize on that. But it could be in any, I mean, it doesn't have to be 
I mean, it could be in some abstract space. No, uh, 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 absolutely. In fact, that's the only thing. If, if, if our communication pro protocol defines three-dimensional space, that would be a limit, I think, that frames don't uh, exist. Well, we define it has to contain a location and orientation. It doesn't say it has to be three-dimensional. Wow, well, there you go. Smart. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said three. Because I think I think brains discover space. Yeah. Neurons don't know about space. I mean, other parts of the brain do, um, perhaps, but the neocortex, the neurons don't really. They just have to discover what what space, what actually the world looks like, and and the, what it really looks like. That's what they're going. So it doesn't have to be three dimensional. So, so we can say that you allow to have. I guess the real fundamental thing of those things is that. They encode uh, independent dimensions. So, that's... yeah. Yeah. And you need to be able to kind of path integrate through that space, I guess. So, like, it works the same if, for example, in 2D Euclidean space, um, it, it would all work the same as long as you can do like location transforms and rotation transforms in that space. Yeah. Anything you feel is missing in the CCP right now? I mean, we've got some kind of exciting, I think exciting stuff in the pipeline. Like, yeah, Vivian briefly touched on like the uh, like motor um, goal state, but uh, yeah, we're hoping that that will kind of really unlock the hierarchical action policies where kind of different learning modules can pass goal states to each other and kind of unlock this more like sub goal based system where like at the moment, yeah, the policy is still quite uh, simple, but but a lot of that is still, yeah, in the conceptual stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, well, it won't change the CCP. The CCP will stay the same. It's no. more that we're thinking about additional connections in the network, like top-down connections, and like Neil says, the motor command connections um, are not really used um, at the moment. Um, and then another thing that we just talked about in the research meeting is that. Um, as part of the features, for example, that get communicated, we might also communicate like object states and object behaviors. Um, mm. But that can also still be phrased in the framework of this CCP. Yeah, in some sense, the goal state, I mean, what's that's an interesting one to think about. What is the difference between a goal state and an object? I mean, a goal is still something you can reason about and, you know, sort of manipulate and decide what aspect of the goal you want it, it, it's still it's not that different from an abstract concept exactly yeah so i guess the kind of whole point we wanted to do was sort of unify that so that the the goal states are in the same form and basically uh, as you say kind of equivalent to the states that a learning module can be in so as in a learning module can express what it sees or it can receive a goal state of what it should be kind of uh in what, what state it should be in and and based on that goal state it can it can try and output other goal states, other learning modules, or or like basic motor actions to achieve that. And that, and that way we can also have hierarchical action policies. So basically, it can decompose a larger goal state into sub goal states and pass them down the hierarchy. And a goal state could, for example, be, I want the sensor to be in this location and orientation, for example, so I get some information to recognize the object. It could also in the future, we don't haven't implemented that yet, be something like, I want this object to be in that state. So to manipulate the world actually um, in some way, not just sensing. Here's an analogy, I think, I think it's apt. And, you know, you don't want to be too over grandiose, but I think this is apt. You know, the internet is based on communication protocol. It was very simple, the IP addressing protocol and packets and so on. And it was designed sufficiently robustly that it enabled everything we do on the internet today. Um, it's gone through a few revisions, but pretty much held up intact. I think the stuff you're working on is, is, is as fundamental as that. And um, in the future, these, if it's not this protocol, something very much like it, will play a similar role. Uh, it'll be as important. It sounds crazy to say that right now, but it seems inevitable in my mind.